Well, it's good to be back with you all. It's exciting to see everybody. We've uh, we've been gone a lot, I know, and it's been uh, exciting for us. So I know it's been exciting for you guys. All the exciting stuff going on in the world today. Get all set up here for you. So the pastor said he's in uh, the fruit of the spirit. So he said, you can do something else or you can keep on going. So I was like, let's keep on going, you know, let's just have a good time with it. So I wanted to talk to you about perfect peace because that was the next one, right? Love, joy, peace. And so let me just pray for us really quickly and then we'll jump right in. Father, thank you so much that you are our peace. And we can, uh, we can just learn about you and understand it. But Father, it needs to be an experiential thing. So would you just give us your words tonight? Would you just teach us? But would you impress upon our hearts how important peace is? And we love you. Thanks for our time together. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, peace is a great subject, isn't it? We'd like to have world peace. That'd be good. We'd like to have peace in the Ukraine. We'd like to have peace everywhere. Allison and I got a chance this past year to spend six weeks uh, in the Greek islands, which you say, ooh, how nice was that, right? Well, we were working with refugees, those that had been able to cross through Turkey from Syria or Afghanistan or uh, get in from uh, Sierra Leone, different countries in Northern Africa or Western Africa. And they were refugees and their countries were in turmoil. Their countries are at war. There's civil war in Sierra Leone. There's Syrian problems with, uh, with uh, all kinds of things. And there's just no peace. And so they come in and they're put in a camp and they're, they're given a place to sleep and some food. And there's still no peace. And so uh, we're able to work with a ministry there called Waymaker International. And they have uh, really been working hard to share the love of Jesus, to show the love of Jesus to the refugees. So Alice and I got to go chan chance to go there. I got to speak with the refugees quite a bit. Allison was able to cook. She did some work with the with the ladies and fed them and got them some presents and just some little things. We met a family that had a baby two weeks before we'd gotten there and the woman had been carrying the baby for two weeks because there's no maternity ward in the camp. There's no stores to go buy things for yourself. And if you did could buy stuff, you don't have any money. You're there with nothing. And so we're able to provide a few items like that. So great opportunity to share, but there's no peace. And so when, when it came to this topic, I thought this is exciting and I'm excited. So I want to kind of basically just go somewhere really simply, the Webster's Dictionary, right? Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And it's fascinating. If you actually look up what they have for the definition of peace, it's amazing. And they break it down like this, freedom from civil disturbance. Okay. And so I want you to, I highlighted civil. All right. That means our, that means our society. That means our community, right? Where we live in the, in the civilized world, we would call it right. So freedom from civil disturbance. In other words, things are at peace, right? There's no fighting. Everybody's just calm or something like that. Right. The second thing they say is a state of security or order within a community kind of the same thing, just said a different way, isn't it? Peace, right? It's in our community. Wouldn't it be nice if just like the world was at peace, which hasn't been at for like, I don't know how many thousands of years, but boy, we think if we could just get the world at peace, then everything would be okay, right? We're trying to, we're trying to fight off. We're trying to fend off other wars and stop wars and not start new wars. And so there's all these conflicts. And usually you find out that's because one person wants their way and the other person wants their way and they're in conflict. So state of security within a community. Okay. Now, how about this one? A state of tranquility or quiet. Now, how, who speaks Spanish? Anybody know tranqui tranquilo? What does tranquilo mean? Right? It's a sense of peace right? It's like, it's tranquil. In fact, I think when the, when Americans first landed on the moon, didn't they land at the sea of tranquility, right? It was just peaceful. It was just quiet. There was nothing there. So, I mean, how could it be anything but peaceful, right? But it's interesting that the word for, for peace or calm or everything's at, 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 at an even state in Spanish is tranquilo. So I like that a state of tranquility. I just put the word rest in there. Right. I put the word in rest because if you think about it in Matthew, what did Jesus say? Come on to me, all you are weary and heavy laden. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light, and you shall find rest for your soul. So wouldn't it be nice if tonight, after you left here, you could just be at rest? Right? Wouldn't, wouldn't it be just nice if everything was good? Everything was in a state of tranquility or quiet. And you're thinking, yeah, that'd be nice, Gary, <laughs> but it is not happening. I got stuff happening when I get home, when I get to work tomorrow, when I get to school tomorrow. There's, I'm already gearing up for the lack of quiet, the lack of rest, the lack of tranquility that's going to happen tomorrow. I'm already like starting to get that way, right? After, I, after we finish here, we have to leave. I have another meeting that's not a fun meeting, but I have to go to another meeting. And already, it's like, if I wasn't at rest, if I wasn't at peace, then I'd be like, well, I really want to hurry up with you guys because I got to go freak out about this next thing that's happening, you know. But I'm going to just be at peace and leave that there. Um, this is another interesting one. Freedom. Notice that, that word freedom again. From disquieting or oppressive thoughts or emotions. Wouldn't that be nice, right? If I wasn't all freaked out about the thing that's happening tomorrow or next week or next month or tonight or tomorrow, you know, what if I could just have a freedom from these oppressive thoughts and emotions? Now I get to do lots of counseling. And so that's a privilege and an honor. And sometimes it's a little sad because so many people, guess what? They don't have a freedom from these oppressive thoughts and emotions. They don't have any freedom, right? And so I get to sit with them and talk with them about the emotions that they're experiencing. Not, oh, you shouldn't feel that way. <laughs> Nobody likes to hear that. Everybody here is like, I'm feeling this way. Let's talk about why I'm feeling this way. Okay, let's talk about that. And so that's what, that's what we want to talk about. This freedom that comes, right? And so disquieting or oppressive thoughts or emotions that you may be experiencing, you, wouldn't you say, oh, I'm not at peace. I am not at peace. And in fact, if you think about it, like if you watch any of the pageants in the world, when they get up there at the end of the pageant, like, what would you like to see? Oh, and world peace, right? Or world peace. I'm not sure which one, but world peace, right? Okay. Harmony in personal relationships. How many would you say like, oh boy, I would love to have some of that, right? This is Webster's Dictionary. So even the world knows what peace is supposed to look like, but it offers no solution, but it can define the problem. That's kind of like if you want to talk about counseling as a Christian counselor, right? I know the world has really great psychology and psychiatric care, but you know what? They're really good at identifying the problem, but only Jesus Christ can provide the solution. And you can say, well, we could take this drug or you could try doing this instead of that, right? But that's still self-effort trying to come up with a solution to my acknowledged problem. And so Christian, for me, Christian counseling is more of this idea that I can say that, yes, you are experiencing pain. You are experiencing problems. You are experiencing disharmony or not, no harmony in your relationship. But let's talk about how Jesus Christ or how God can make a difference so that you could experience it. Instead of saying, well, the easiest way to have harmony in relationships is to end all tumultuous relationships. You, and we do that, right? Oh, I'm in conflict with my spouse. What's the answer? Let me just leave my spouse. That'll fix it. But here's an old saying. I don't know if you know this or not. Wherever you go, there you are. And so, wow, I take my, I take my stuff with me. I put, put it back in my suitcase and I pack it up and I move. And we do it with kids all the time, right? If kids are fighting, what do we tell them? Separate, go to your room. I don't want to hear about it. Instead of saying, you need to sit there together until you figure this out. So we've learned that we just leave in relationships. So it's hard. Okay, so, you know me, I'm very kind of logical and analytical and I like to sort of figure things out. So I figured out there's two distinctly different kinds of peace. Okay, now you could probably argue there's different kinds. But, but, but for me, there's just two distinctively different kinds of peace. All right. And this is the way I labeled them. External peace and internal peace. Okay. 
just external peace and internal peace. And if you think about the four definitions, if you go back and look at our definitions, what did they say? They said civil disturbance, what would that be? That would be an external one, right? Security within our community, what would that be? An external one, right? A state of tranquility. Okay, now we're starting to get a little internal, right? Freedom from disquieting thoughts, internal, right? Harmony in relationships, all internal, right? So, so there's two ways, external and internal, and we're going to talk about both of them tonight, if we have time, okay? Probably run out of time. The world wants to solve your solutions or, or solve your problems with ex... Wow, I can't even say this right. To, to obtain peace, the world wants to solu solve external issues, all right? So in other words, in Ukraine, if we could just get the Russians to stop doing this and the Ukrainians to start doing that or the, the Russians to start doing this and stop doing that, then we would have external peace. But lives have already been ruined. Things are already falling apart in both countries. So there really isn't peace, but we would do an external peace. So the world says if we solve this problem, maybe we could have some peace. And yet what's the history of the world been? Look at the children of Israel. If you look at the children of Israel from, say, the time of captivity in Egypt, all, all the way through, all the way through the, the journey through the desert, all the way to the time when there was King David, right? There was Saul and then King David and then King Solomon. Those were three guys. They each had a 40 year reign. And that 120 years is literally been the only time of peace within that country. And as soon as Solomon died, it blew up again. And so literally in the history of the world, maybe a few hundred years out of thousands of years, you could point to times when there was peace in the world. But the world was going to tell you, the world is always going to tell you that if you solve the external problem, you can obtain peace. You see how that works? And that's what we think, right? We think if I fix that, then I'll be okay. They won't have external peace. Their houses, houses have been blown up. Their, their world is blown up, isn't it? Externally. Okay. Right? So externally, the world's been blown up. Um, think about all, like the refugees. The refugees that we work with, they, they have no external peace at all. Their countries are all at war. Their countries are all torn apart. Their countries are oppressing them for their religious beliefs, whatever it is they're being oppressed for. And so they want out. Because they think if they could get out of that oppression, they could experience peace. But then they get put in a, in a camp, and guess what? There's no peace in the camp either. So they're like, well, where can we go? There's nowhere to go that we can have peace. Well, maybe if we get out of the camp, but then they get out of the camp and they find out, wow, now I, now I have no country and I'm still not at peace. So the world will tell you there's always some external way to obtain peace. And we're going to find out that's false. Okay? God wants to solve internal problems to obtain peace. You see the difference? Can I be at peace during war? Yes, I can. Can I be at peace in a meeting where people are yelling at me? Can I be at peace when it's not going well at work? Can I be at peace when it's not going well at home? Can I be at peace? Or have I believed that if I fix the external, the internal will be okay. And so you see the difference? The world has trained us, fix the outside and the inside will be better. And God came and said, you know what? N no, wrong, fix the inside. And then it doesn't matter on the outside. It doesn't mean you enjoy the outside. It doesn't mean you have a, a, a rosy life. What it means is during the trials that you go through, you're at peace. Okay, there's a huge difference and the world is trying to tell us and, and even church sometimes. Well, if you do this and do this and stop doing that and start doing this, then you'll have peace. If you'd pray more, I'm sure if you would give more and you would do more. And if you would stop doing that and you'd start doing this, then you could find, and you start working and you're like, 
wow, I'm, I'm experiencing actually more anxiety <laughs> and less peace than I, am, than I thought I would if I would do all these things. And, and who likes to be told what to do? If you do this, you'll be better. So here I am telling you what to do to be better, right? I'm just trying to help us all understand. So the world wants to solve external problems and God wants to solve internal problems. And if you read the whole, I mean, if you go back with that thought in mind, if you go back and read all the gospels, you'll see Jesus doing this every time, every time. And you'll be like, oh my goodness, it's actually in this, it's in there. If I read that, if I come from that mindset, I see it, I see it, I see it. So I challenge you, just reread some of the gospels and look at Jesus and his internal versus external perspective. I'll give you one very short example. He's in front of Pilate and he's, and he's about to be executed. And Pilate, Pilate says, well, are you a king? Are you a king? You know, and Jesus said, this is not my kingdom because if it was, we would fight for it. And so he's already saying, look, my kingdom is not what you're looking around at. It's somewhere else. You see the internal versus external there. Okay. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. But there's actually within the peace of the internal peace, there's two kinds of peace within that. There's peace with God and the peace of God. And they're different. All right. And so what happens is we, we want to, we want to, we think if we're at peace with God, then we're experiencing the peace of God and it's different. There's a different way to, to see it here, and I'll show you through some scripture. But I just want you to get the idea. First, there's external and there's internal. Then there's with God and of God, and they're different, okay? So, we were born into sin. If you, now, you may say that's narrow-minded. You may say, well, who are you to tell me? But uh, I, I don't know about you, but if you've ever watched the behavior of small children, you can tell they're born with some sin. Because I don't know how they're, who teaches them to lie? I mean, as soon as they start talking there, who did that? Not me. I'm like, I just watched you do it. Somehow they know. <laughs> right? And so, so we're all born into sin. The world will tell you, oh, you can't say that about me. Well, okay. That's because I want to be okay. I don't want to be condemned. I don't want to th be thinking that there's something wrong with me. And yet deep down inside, what do we all know? There's something wrong. There's something wrong. Right? And so I, I, I just, I don't want to make any bones about it, but, but with, we're born into sin and we are enemies of God at that moment in time. We're born that way. It's not our fault. We're just, that's the way it is. And so how, how come I was born in America and someone else was born in Africa? How come someone was born in Turkey and, some, and, and is experiencing earthquakes and, and poor building codes? And I live in America where we have amazing building codes and we can survive earthquakes and stuff. It's not fair. Life's not fair, right? So we were born, we were born into sin because of Adam and Eve, because of original sin, however you want to think about that. We were born distant from God, enemies with God. Okay. And, and what happens is, what happens is the world wants to tell you, oh, it's not that bad. Like God is so much love. Don't worry about it. Just, just be, try to be a good person. And, you know, hopefully at the end, God will take care of it. Um, I've had some great conversations with some, with some, um, uh, people from Syria and their thoughts on, well, I said, well, what happens when you die if you weren't as good as you thought you were supposed to be? Well, we're just hoping that God is merciful and gracious. You're hoping? Yeah. I say, that's not really good. That's not a, is that a good plan? And they're like, it's the only plan we know. And then it's like, well, would you like a different plan? Okay. So way back, way back a long time ago, the children of Israel were in Israel. Uh, of course, that's why they were the children of Israel. They were in, they were in Jerusalem. And they were about to become into captivity, right? The, the Babylonians were coming and they were going to surround their cities and they were going to destroy them. And Jeremiah, the prophet was like, we need to surrender. God is telling us, we just, we need to just quit and surrender because we have been, we've been overtaken. And Jeremiah was telling them this and the priests and the prophets were like, 
it's not that bad. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. Just, just keep going. It'll be okay. So in this chapter, it says, from the least of them to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. And the prophets to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They're telling you lies. And this is God speaking to the children of Israel. Then he says this, they have healed the brokenness of my people superficially saying, peace, peace. But guess what? There's no peace. And so, and so everyone in the leadership was a, or the children of Israel were like, don't worry about the Babylonians. God will take care of us. We're, it's not that bad. And Jeremiah was like, we need to surrender now because it's going to get bad. And everybody was like, no, no, it'll be fine. So I, I don't want to be the one to tell you that if you don't have Jesus Christ as your savior, then you're an enemy of God and there will never be peace for you. But you need to understand that without God as your savior to take away the sin that was born into you, you don't have a shot at peace. Now you can have some temporary peace. Like if you're drugged out or you think, well, if I have enough money, I'll have plenty of peace. But then you're always worried if someone's going to take your money. If you ever buy a new car, what's the first thing you start worrying about? Who's going to ding it or hit it in the parking lot or who's going to put the first scratch in it, right? So as soon as you think you have something that brings peace, it's going to, it's going to just disappear on you like sand. Okay. And so what I wanted to let you know is that we're enemies with God until Jesus Christ came to take away the penalty for our sin. Okay. And so the world's going to tell you this world right now, if you look outside, if you said best way to experience peace, it'd be like, well, you need to do some yoga or you need to do some deep breathing, which are all good things, but they aren't going to bring you peace. They may settle you down in the moment, but they don't cure the need for peace. This is the way Paul wrote it in Romans for while we were enemies. What is an enemy? Someone we're not at peace with. Someone we're not at peace with. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we'll be saved by his life. Now, there's a lot in that. And we could spend a whole sermon on that. But I just want you to get the idea. If you don't understand this, if you are not a child of God, you're an enemy of God. I've told you before, there's really only two kinds of people. Dead people and alive people. They either dead in their nature against God or they're alive to God in their nature. And so there's really only two. So if you want to put it a different way, you're either a friend of God or an enemy of God. There's only two. There's only two. Jesus said, if you're not for me, then you're against me. And so think about it. I mean, are you going to say like, well, I'm for my spouse, but I like to date other people. Well, you can't be for your spouse and for other people. You're either for other people or you're for your spouse. I mean, that's a totally dis disgusting thought, but... It's true. You can't be for this and for that. And so this is the problem we have. We, we want to say everything is okay. Everything is good. No, there is truth. There is truth. And so if you don't experience the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and accept that for the payment for your, for your sin, then you're an enemy of God. And, and I, I can be kind and say, like, well, you know, good for you. Hope that works out. It's like, no, I want you to know you're at enemy. You're an enemy of God. You're at war with God, just like Satan is at war with God. And so while we were sinners now for Christians, those of us that believe that Jesus paid the price for our sin and we've accepted him as Lord and savior of our life. And we want to follow that. It says we were enemies. So that's the good news. If you're a Christian, you were an enemy of God, but now you're not. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm not warring against somebody, I kind of like them. I like, I like that. I like to have the ability to be in relationship with somebody who's not always worried, trying to pick a fight with me. And so if I'm, if I'm a friend of God, if I'm a child of God, then guess what? He's not trying to pick a fight with me. Now I might be trying to pick one with him because he's not doing the way life, the way I think he ought to do it. But then that's for me to adjust, okay? So while we were sinners, God reconciled us to him through the death of his son. So there's, there's the solution, okay? Then he says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, by placing your trust into the fact that God killed Jesus Christ and his death, his burial, and his resurrection is the thing that gives you new life. By doing that, by having that, you've been justified. We have peace with God. 
And then he says, how? Through Jesus Christ. Okay? And so there is a peace. This is the peace with God. We are no longer at war. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, he is not trying to fix you up. You know why? He's already fixed you up. You're good. You're good to go. You're going to heaven when you die, and you have the ability to experience peace now if you want to. If you want to, and we'll find out how to get there. All right? So that's peace with God. We're no longer enemies. Now, who's the enemy of, of God? Satan, all his little minions, all the people who are like, you know what? I need to be my own God. I, I don't need some God in heaven to be my God. I will be my own God. And that started way back with Satan when he said, you know what? I want to be God. I want you to worship me like God. In fact, think about it. Jesus was tempted by Satan. He took him to the top of a pinnacle and he said, he said, look out at all the world. You want these people to bow down to you? You bow down to me and I'll let them bow down to you. He wanted to be God. And of course, Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord, your God. And so Satan is opposed. The enemy is opposed. And so, if you're not a Christian, you're an enemy. And, and my only thought there is like, why would you want to be an enemy of God, the Almighty God? Why not learn how to be friends with Him by what He did for you, not what you do for Him? Okay? So, we've been justified by, we have peace with God. And that's where we want to start. For it was the, God, the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness of God to dwell in Him, being Jesus, it says in Colossians, and that through him to reconcile all things to himself. So who did the work? God did the work. You see, it's not how good you can become. It's not how good you're doing right now. It's not how good you will be someday. It's that God did all the work through Jesus Christ, right? Whether things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace. How? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. It was his sacrifice for you and it was his sacrifice for me that allowed us to be at peace with God. God is no longer angry. God is not trying to fix you. He's already fixed you. We need to learn how to operate in the fixed mode because we think external things fix us when actually we've already been fixed on the inside. We need to learn how to walk in that fixedness. So if you think about the fruit of the spirit, right? It's the spirit of God that dwells within you that produces love and joy and peace and patience. It's not even you going, you know what? I, I just, I just gotta like next week, we're gonna have to be patient. Right. And I don't know about you, but there's like, that is one thing I do not like. In fact, I can prove we don't like patience because we, we numbered our food in the restaurant. We're too lazy to say I'd like a hamburger and some fries and a Coke. We can't say three words. We just want number one. Right. And then we're in such a hurry. We don't have enough patience to wait in line in the store. So we invented drive through <laughs> Right. And now the world drives through to get their food because we, we don't have time. So wait till next week when we get the patience. I'll just, I'll be off there somewhere. Okay. So Jesus Christ's death allowed us to be at peace with God. He is no longer angry at us. He is for us. We are his children. I have five kids and how many grandkids? Four Four grandkids, gotta keep track, right? And guess what? Sometimes their behavior is not that great, but I am for them. I want the best for them. I'm not there trying to nitpick them going, you know, if you'd wear a different shirt, you'd look a little bit better, right? I'm like, wow, it's good to see you because you're my child, you're my grandbaby, right? Sometimes they're a little frustrating, but that's because I'm human. But I'm for my children. I am for my grandbabies. And guess what? God is for you. Why? If you're his child, he is for you. He is for you. And he made a way. He made peace through the, through the blood of Jesus on the cross. All right. So if you want to think about it this way, peace is a gift from God that we couldn't, that, and we couldn't fix that problem, right? We couldn't fix that problem. You can be good enough to earn peace with God. It has to be given to you by Jesus Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection. God gives us the gift of peace. He's like, if you want to be on my team, if you want to be my child, if you want to be rescued from your sin and, and death, then I will bring you into the fold. I will adopt you as my child. I will graft you into the family. I will put you in the fold and you are now mine. You are my child because of what I did for you. 
not what you're doing for me. Okay? It's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast, right? It's, it's the problem we can't fix. And so God fixed it for us. Okay, so guess what? We are reborn into righteousness. We're born into death. We're born initially into, into spiritual death. We're born into our physicalness. And then guess what? We're reborn into righteousness. And guess what that does? Makes us friends of God. And we're at peace. Now, if you're warring with God, that's okay. He's at peace with you. If you're his child, if you're warring against him saying like, you can't have my life. I want to be my own boss. I don't want you in my life. That's okay. You're an enemy of God. He'll wait patiently, but I would urge you to quickly adjust your thoughts and accept him so that you can be at peace with God because you'll lose that battle. I mean, how about you, but like I've got an eight month old granddaughter and we can arm wrestle, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to win. Right. I mean, I, I can take her pretty sure I can take it, right? And it's the same with God. We're like, no, I'm going to take on God. Like, Good luck with that. <laughs> Satan's been trying for thousands of years and he's still losing. He's still losing. But we think, oh, I can do it. Okay, if you want to. So being reborn, Jesus looked at Nicodemus and said, you must be born again. So if you hear that term, oh, are you a born again Christian? What does that mean? It means I've been birthed into the family of God. I have his DNA. I'm at peace with him. He's at peace with me. We're a family. We're tight. He is for me. I am for him. Now, the peace of God. Whole different subject, right? But you cannot experience the peace of God until you experience peace with God. So don't even try. I mean, you can try, but it's not going to work, right? The world will try to tell you how to get peace in your life, but it doesn't work because it's all external. And what Christ is trying to do is help us from the inside out. So the peace of God, all right? The world still wants to solve external problems. I'm just telling you, if you think about it, that's all they tell you to do. Take this drug. I, I, there's so many drugs I either need to take or talk to my doctor about on television. It's ridiculous. I, 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 I need to make an appointment. Well, what are you here for today? Well, I need to talk to you about these 12 different drugs. Well, wh why? Because the TV told me I need, if I took these drugs... I saw the guy slam dunk in a basketball. And I assume if I took that drug, then I could slam dunk a basketball. You know, the world tries to solve external problems. Okay. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. We have been deceived to believe that, ex that, that if we solve the external problems, that will bring peace. As Christians, we've been deceived. We think if you'll do something different, if you'll start or you'll stop, then I'll be okay. Man, if I could just get that promotion, everything would be great. If I could just find the right person to live with, everything will be perfect. If I just had the right house, if I just had the right, if the, the, right? And we're searching for things that we think will do what? Bring us peace. Okay, it might be more money, better job. You just name it. You just think about the things you spend your time thinking about that will solve your problems. And I guarantee you, almost 99% of them are going to be external things. If this would happen, then I'd be okay. And so that's the deception of Satan. It's a lie from Satan that we have believed that if we could fix the external, the internal would be fixed. But it's a lie from Satan. So, so hopefully, as we talk these last few slides out, you'll see there's what, what, what's happened. Okay? Now, it's always fun to listen to Jesus. And Jesus said this, Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Okay? So, wow, that's like, wait, I thought Jesus was like, you know, peace on earth, goodwill to men, and Right? It's on earth peace, not peace on earth. And there's a huge difference between on earth peace for those whom God loves, right? Versus peace on earth. He didn't come to bring peace on earth. If he had, he'd have to blow up the entire world government system and say, I'm in charge now and here's the way it's going to work. Right? But he didn't fight against them. Who did he fight against the most? The religious people. Right? Right? Because they'd made it an external thing. Do this, do this, do this. Oh, you're unclean. Oh, you're clean. You're not clean. You're clean. Come and, you know. So it's all external stuff. And Jesus was all about the internal. So he didn't come to bring peace on earth. We're like, oh, 
No, he came to bring peace with God for us so that we could then experience the peace of God. Okay, now he says this, peace I leave you, my peace I give to you, here it is, not as the world gives do I give to you. You see the difference? He wants to give you his peace. That's the gift. Okay, first of salvation, and secondly, as that fruit of the Spirit flows through you, you'll experience peace. Now let me ask you this. I'm pretty sure apple trees grow apples, right? We're all good with that? Okay, and so what is the fruit of an apple tree? Yeah. An apple. Now, what's the, what's the relationship between the tree and the fruit? The tree bore the fruit, but who's the fruit for? The squirrels or the people that harvest them, the people that eat them, right? So in other words, the fruit is not necessarily for the tree, is it? The fruit is for someone else. So what if as a person who has the Spirit of God in me, I allow peace to flow through me so that other people could experience peace? That's why it says, as, as much as it's up to you, live at peace with all people, right? And so we are supposed to be vessels of peace. And as we experience the, the peace that comes, it will flow out to other people. Have you ever met those people? They just seem to be like, I don't know why, they're just okay. There's something wrong with them, right? They're just like, they seem to have it all together. Or maybe they don't have it all together, but they just seem to be kind of calm, peaceful people. You like to hang out with them because they seem to be just like, hey, I'm, I'm good. That was Jesus, right? He was always seemed to be at peace. So my peace I give to you, not as the world. Then he says this, don't let your hearts be troubled or fearful. Now, that's going to be a big word we're going to find. Think about troubled or fearful. I'm going to just change the word troubled with anxiety. Okay, because that's what troubled is. It's like, anybody anxious? No. Excellent. Nobody's, nobody's anxious. We are done. No. Anxious, right? So then he says, don't let your heart be anxious or fearful. So he's going to give us peace. And then says, look, I'm going to give you my peace. Not like the world, not this external stuff that you've been looking at, that you've been deceived to think is the thing. I'm going to give you peace and you will not experience anxiety or fearfulness because of the peace that I'm giving to you. John 16 says this, these things I've spoken to you that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have peace. Troubles, trials, tribulations. Can I get an amen to that? Right? <laughs> right? We're like, yeah, we're on that part, Jesus. Yeah, guess what? Take courage. Why? I've overcome the world. And you see, we think, no, no, you haven't. Because if you'd have overcome the world, then it would look like this for me. And then I would experience peace. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. You're going to have tribulations. You're going to have trials. But you can be at peace through those because I've already overcome all of that for you, if you'll let me. So experiencing the peace of God is something that we have to actively allow God to give us almost every day. Now, I might, I might argue it this way, to give it to you circumstance by circumstance, or event by event. So think of the next thing that's coming up that's giving you a little tense, right? You get that little, oh man, tomorrow... Uh, I, I really don't want to go into that meeting. I don't, I'm not ready for this test. I don't want to do X, Y, or Z tomorrow, right? That thing. What if you said, you know what, God, right now, I'm going to give you that event and I'm going to just experience peace, trusting you that whatever happens, you've overcome it. You've overcome it, right? That's where we get to the trust. Here's the way Paul says it. Don't be anxious about anything. Okay, that just is a horrible line. You should never write something like that, right? That's like, try not to be anxious. That's not what it says, right? And, and I know a lot of people that love their Bibles that say like, look at all the commandments, love your neighbor, do this, do this. And it's like, well, here's one that says, don't be anxious. Well, that was just a suggestion. Oh, really? That one's a suggestion. The other ones are commands, but this one, guess what? That's a command. 
You want to look through your Bible for all the commands that Paul wrote in the New Testament? Great. Be this, do this, do this. Here's one. Don't be anxious. Whoa, that's like not possible. Or is it, right? Don't be anxious about anything. Well, that's like even harder. Like, I mean, that's a double whammy. And if you think about it, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious about what? Anything. Like, what are you, crazy? You can't write stuff like that. But what does he say? But in everything, in everything. So what does that mean? I'm in the midst of it. Are you in the midst of it? I'm in the midst of it, right? The storms are howling. Things are happening. Work's not going great. Relationships are tough. Things at school, things at work, things with my parents, things with my kids. In everything, by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, does that sound that hard? I have a counselee. I was like, you're, you're not buddies with Jesus yet. And they're like, what? I was like, you, you, you are forcing things. And right now you just need to be chatting with Jesus about it. And he's like, okay, that's, you're, you're not using enough churchy words for me. I'm like, okay, you need to pray more. Oh, okay. I get that. I was like, or maybe you just say like in the middle of this moment, I'm experiencing anxiety. God, I'm going to give you my anxiety. I'm going to give you my, this situation right now is out of control but I know who's in control, right? So I'm going to give you this moment. Now, let me tell you a secret, okay? This is a secret. He won't take your moments. You have to give them to him. He will not take them. You have to give them. And there's a huge difference there. There's a huge difference between saying, God, take this, and Lord, I'm giving you this. There's a huge difference, right? There's a huge difference there. Make your request known to God. Lord, this is not going the way I had planned. I'm experiencing intense anxiety over this situation. And the reason is because it's not going the way I think it should go. But I'm going to chat with you right now and say, I'm giving it to you. I'm releasing this to you. Jesus himself said what? In the garden. He said, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. But... Nevertheless, not my will, but I'm going to hand it over to you. Your will be done. And you almost see this calmness of Jesus as he l releases that, right? Take this cup from me. But he's like, you know what? Let this pass, but no, never mind. It's almost like he said, never mind. Not, not what I'm thinking, but I'm going to release this to you. Okay? Now, this is what the next verse says. If you will do that, if you will release things, it says the peace of God. There's that phrase, that indwelling Holy Spirit peace that is in there waiting to just break out. But you've got it all bottled up because you're trying to control it and hang on to it. If you will release, then the peace of God, which will go beyond anything you can comprehend. You're like, why am I at peace in this? I should be freaking out right now. And someone else might actually say, you know, you should be freaking out right now. But you're not. Have you ever been in a situation like that? I have. Maybe I just get to be in more crazy situations or something. But there's people like, you should be freaking out. It's like, no, I'm good. They're like, how can you be good? Because I'm trusting Jesus. Right? And, I, and I, get, I get opportunities to practice all the time. All the time I get opportunities to practice this. Oh, I'm starting to freak out, Jesus. Oh, wow. Hang on a second. You know what? I'm going to give you this, Father. I'm going to give you this right now. And I'm going to just rest in your peace. And I'm going to trust you that you know what you're doing. Because let's be honest. We, we don't trust God. <laughs> Who's the only person we trust? I would trust me. And God's there saying, but you can trust me. I'm trustworthy. I'm God. I never fail. I see your failures, but I am for you. We'll get through this together. If you'll stop holding on so tight to things, maybe I could do some work, but I'm not going to yank it out of your hand. I'm asking you to release it to me and trust me. You see the difference? But boy, we want to fight the other way. The peace of God that passes comprehension, it guards your heart and your mind. It's the thing that allows you to go like, wow, I should be freaking out right now. 
but the peace of God that dwells within me is just like, it's telling me I'm okay. I don't like where I am. I don't like the situation I'm in. I'm going to keep entrusting the Father with the right solutions. And let's be honest, half the time we end up with something and we're like, God, why did this happen like this? And he kind of goes like, well, Gary, <laughs> that was all you. You did that one all by yourself, right? You ever, kids do that, right? You're like, don't run, don't run, don't, or walk, walk. And they run and they fall down and they skin their knee and they look at you and it's like, whoa, that was all. Try to tell you, but you had to experience it, right? So there's things we have to experience, but hopefully what our experience teaches us is, I need to start listening to God more and stop listening to myself so much and allow the father to manage my life for me. Trust him with the situations. It doesn't mean I don't walk. It means as I walk, he's with me in that walking. I'm constantly talking to the father about, wow, this is not going well, right? The meeting I have at 645 tonight, it's like, I don't know how it's going, but you know what? Doesn't matter. It could go my way. It could go against me. It's okay. Why? Because the father already knows the outcome and he's okay with the outcome. And he will allow the outcome to be the way it needs to be that grows me. And that's awesome. So it guards my heart. It guards my mind. When I start to get anxious, when I start to get afraid, there's this piece that pops up. It's like, wait a second, Gary. I thought you were allowing me to manage your life for you. Oh, whew, thanks. I forgot. Just had a little moment there, right? Now I'm old enough to, I'm almost old enough. I don't know what the age limit is, but I'm almost old enough to go, oh, senior moment. So, right? Getting there anyway. I need to have those moments. And what happens is as I learn to trust and as I learn to walk and find out, oh, I'm okay. It, all that stuff I thought was going to happen, it didn't happen. In fact, psychiatrists will tell you 90% of what you worry about never comes to true fruition anyway. But for some reason, we worry about it instead of saying, God, Man, I do not like this situation. This is not going the way I thought it should go. Whew. I'm going to trust you with it. I'm going to let you have it, right? That's what guards our hearts and minds. It's that little thing that goes, Gary, hello, what are, you, what are you thinking right now? Ooh, I don't know. Not the right thing. Okay. So anxiety and fears are the enemies of peace. So if you're like, man, I just... Uh, I just, I just don't experience any peace, Gary. All right. What's, what are your fears? What are your anxieties? People come to me for counseling and they're just like, I, I just, I just can't sleep. I can't, I can't think straight. I'm confused. I'm like, great. What are your fears? Oh, I'm not really afraid of anything. I'm thinking to myself, liar, but you know, we'll get around to it. Right. But as they start to talk with me, they're like, Oh my goodness, I am freaking out about that. I am worried about this. I am scared about that. So they put different words to it. But suddenly they start to realize, wow. And then I'm like, man, if all, after all that, I don't think I can sleep. You can't sleep because you've got that running in your head night and day. And now you tell me about it. I have to put it on paper so I can leave it in the office locked up. I don't want to carry that around. You've got to release it. So anxiety and fear are the enemies of peace. Trust is the antidote. Okay? Trust is the antidote. So what does that look like? In the midst of my situation, my event, I'm like, wow, I am freaking out. This is going to go bad for me. This is not happening the way I thought it should happen. I'm going to get fired. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to, whatever it is, you, whatever, wherever those thoughts come from, in that moment, you have to go, wait a second, wait a second. Not my way, Jesus, your way. I'm going to trust you with this. And I'm going to release it to you because here's the lie. Trust and verify is what Ronald Reagan said in the 80s, if you're not old enough to remember. Trust and verify, which was like, we're going to trust you, but we're also going to verify, which means we don't trust you. Right? And that's kind of what we do with God. We kind of go like, God, I'm going to trust you with it, but I'm going to be checking in to see how you're doing. You know? I'll give you some pointers if you get stuck, Jesus. I know you're God, but you know, let me, I'll help you as much as I can to, for you to get it right. And he's like, well, thanks for the help, Gary. And that sounds dumb, but that's what we do. 
That's what we do. We want to trust, but verify with God. Trust is like, I'm getting out of the boat, right? Peter was on the, in the boat and he saw the person coming and goes, Jesus, if that's you, call me and I'll get out of the boat. And Jesus said, y'all come. And, and he got out of the boat. Now that was serious trust right there. And so, so many times we're like, oh, we're in the boat in the storm. And here comes Jesus going, hey, it's me. Get out of the boat. And you're like, no, this boat might be going down, but you know what? I'm just going to stay right here. It's safe. It's going down, but you know, but, but I'm over here. Come, come to me. All you are weary and heavy laden. No, I'm going to stay in my boat. I'm going to keep bailing. <laughs> That's what we do. So trust is the antidote for the anxiety and fear. You have to be willing to release. He will not take it that way. That's why Paul says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Throw them at him. Throw them at him. Jesus, this is messed up. I give it to you. And I'm going to trust you with the results. Doesn't mean it always turns out the way we wanted it to turn out, but it turns out the way God has a plan for. He will manage it for us if we let him. So trust is the antidote for anxiety and fear. Okay, I'm over time. We'll end with this verse here. The steadfast of mind, you will keep in perfect peace. So it's an old word, right? Steadfast. Those that are willing to walk through it. If you will stay on the path, those of you that will do that, if you will keep your mind there, you will be in perfect peace. Why will you be at perfect peace? Because he trusts in you. So that's us, right? If I want to be steadfast of mind, I will find a perfect peace because I keep trusting God. And so that's my challenge to you. The next situation that stirs up and you start getting, you need an antacid or a Tums or whatever you need. Cause like, it's not going and I'm starting to worry. And I, you need to just stop for a second and go like, Whoa, I stop. And I'm going to put my trust in you, Jesus, wherever this goes, I trust you. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you that we can trust you because you're trustworthy. You are the only one that's trustworthy. In fact, if we trust in anything else, it's probably going to let us down. Jesus said it this way. He said, we should build our house on the rock. And when the storms come, the house will stay. So Father, help us when we've, when we started to build houses on sand and partly on sand and partly on you, help us to move the whole house to you and on solid rock we stand. All other things are sinking sand, so we want to trust you. Father, I pray you'd give us the courage, the, the, uh, the wisdom, and the want to, to place our trust in you, the only one that knows what we really truly need. And then we help us to experience your peace, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.